Good afternoon. I'm Yalan Ferenjo, a project manager at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled STR Profiling for Mouse Cell Lines, another tool to combat cell line misidentification, presented by Ms. Balsam Shockey and Dr. Brian Shapiro. Ms. Shockey is a senior biologist at ATCC, while Dr. Shapiro is a scientific content specialist. In this presentation, Dr. Shapiro will discuss the importance of authenticating cell lines and introduce the short tandem repeat profiling method. Ms. Shockey will then focus on ATCC's new unique STR profiling service for mouse cells. After the presentation, we invite you to join in on the discussion as we answer your questions. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as, the as time al allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Shapiro. Thank you, Yalan. Before I start today's presentation, a little background on ATCC. ATCC was founded in 1925 and is a private, independent, nonprofit organization headquartered in Manassas, Virginia. We also have an R&D facility in Gaithersburg, Maryland, focused on developing better biological models for biomedical research. ATCC is the world's premier biological materials resource and standards development organization. We advance authentication and reproducibility in research by developing new solid means of identifying and authenticating the cell lines and microbes that are critical to research. Which brings us to the topic of today's presentation, cell line authentication. I'm going to start out by discussing the impact of misidentified cells on basic and clinical research. I will then introduce SGR profiling describing how this powerful technique can be used to authenticate the identity of cell lines. Then I'll pass the talk over to authentication expert and senior biologist, Balsam Shockey. She will focus on ATCC's new STR service for the authentication of mouse cell lines. Balsam will then touch on when and why you should authenticate your cells. After wrapping things up, we'll answer your questions and have a general discussion on cell line authentication. So first, let me talk about the consequences of using misidentified cell lines. It's really pretty basic. If you're using a cell line that's not authenticated in your research, then you are at a very high risk for loss of the cell line itself, for example, if it was mislabeled or contaminated with another cell line, loss of the time that was spent by you and your technicians, and money on the reagents and lab consumables used in that research. If you publish something, you're basically contributing to misinformation in the public domain. If your colleagues try the same experiments in the bona fide cell line, then you're likely to see discordant or irreproducible results. This can result in the retraction of your publications and probably worst of all to a scientist, a tarnished reputation. Best said by Jeffrey Boatwright of Emory University, if we're not using what we think we're using, we're not testing our hypotheses. We're just gumming up the literature. I'm not sure what we're doing, but that's not science. This slide shows that if you use misidentified cell lines, not only is your research at risk, but your colleagues won't hesitate to call you out for it. There have been numerous examples of misidentified cell lines over the years, many of these in human cell lines, and you can expect that since 75% uh, of the cells used in research are human in origin. But we can still highlight a few examples of misidentification in mouse cell lines. For example, the McCoy cell line was originally derived from human synovial fluid in 1955, but in 1994, Fong and colleagues discovered to be murine in origin. In 2013, a rat retinal ganglion cell line was determined to be of murine origin, specifically the cell line 661W. 
In 2014, Didion et al. did a study using SNP array profiling that indicated that 15 out of the 99 cell lines tested were either misidentified or contaminated with other cell lines. And in a 2017 study by Kozue Uchio Yamada and colleagues, mouse cell lines registered with the JCRB cell bank were examined by simple sequence link polymorphism analysis to identify their strains. Based on comparisons with seven major inbred strains, their results revealed that 15% of the cell lines that were tested were misidentified, and they were different than the strains that they were originally registered. And finally, last year it was revealed that old aliquots of an equine macrophage cell line stored at the Animal Health Trust actually contain murine cells. So the literature is rife with examples of cell line misidentification. With the advent of mouse STR, we can expect to see more of this. You can't ignore the impact of misidentified cell lines on clinical research. Let's take a look at J.J. Boonster's landmark paper in 2010. They did a study on 40 esophageal adenocarcinoma cell lines and found that three of those were misidentified. What's really scary, though, is that data that came from experiments using those cell lines was used in over 100 scientific publications, at least three NIH grants, 11 patients, and perhaps scariest of all, a clinical trial that recruited EAC patients. So the impact of using misidentified cell lines cannot be overstated. Using misidentified cell lines bears a high economic impact as well. In 2015, a study by Friedman and colleagues aimed to estimate the direct costs of irreproducible research. They did a search of NIH reporter for projects using cell line or cell culture. And this search suggests that NIH currently funds about $3.7 billion annually on research using cell lines. Given that a quarter of these research projects apparently use misidentified or contaminated cell lines, the monetary loss could be up to $925 million, almost a billion dollars. And even if only 10% of research is conducted using misidentified cell lines, the loss is still upwards 370 million. So how can you prevent cell line misidentification and make sure that your results are the correct results? Well, probably the best way of authenticating your cell lines as far as cell identity goes is short tandem repeat profiling. STR profiling has been available for some years now and is the same technology that forensics laboratories use to identify individuals for paternity testing, linking suspects to crime scenes, and identifying victims. Since there are many kits out there for STR for forensic purposes, it made sense to provide a standard using this for cell line identity. So STR profiling for human cell line authentication was established as an ANSI standard in 2012. The standard describes a consistent, inexpensive, and universally applicable method for authenticating new and established cell lines and their criteria for use. It was chaired by John Masters of University College of London and ATCC's own Dr. Yvonne Reed. So what is SCR profiling? And why is it the best technology for authenticating a cell's identity? The technology is based on identifying target sequences based on microsatellite DNA. Microsatellite DNA are short repeats of two to six base pairs that can repeat from five to 50 times. The repeats can be either simple and next to each other or complex and separated by short intervening sequences. The protocol itself only requires one to two nanograms of DNA and one to two fragments. The analysis is easy to read as the result is returned as a series of discrete alleles, which I'll talk about more uh, in a moment. Each allele can be converted into a numerical value and entered or retrieved in a database. The STR markers are distributed throughout the genome 
So matches are possible even with the loss of a chromosome. Microsatellite DNA is also highly variable with populations, making this a highly informative test for identifying cells. Now, this table shows you the properties of STRs for human cells. While the exact loci are different for the mouse, the principle is the same. Each locus is found either on a different chromosome or a different region of a chromosome. Each has a tetranucleotide repeating motif and an expected number of repeats typical for the population. For example, in the top row here, locus D16S539, or D16 for short, is located on chromosome 16 on the Q arm. Its repeat motif is GATA, and uh, you can expect to see five to 15 uh, repeating units. Uh, similarly, D7 is uh, located on the Q arm of chromosome seven. It also has a repeating motif of GATA, uh, six to 15 repeating units. And D13 is located on the Q arm of chromosome 13. Its repeating motif is a little different. It's TATC and has five to 15 repeating units. The assay really shows its power when you calculate the probability based on population statistics the two uh, cell lines are the same. If you use all eight markers that are shown here, the power of discrimination or the probability that two cell lines are identical is one in 120 million. In uh, addition, I forgot to mention, we also use a marker for gender determination, a melogenin. For STR profiling for mouse cells, we use markers at 18 different loci, as Balsam will mention later in the presentation. So I've showed you the characteristics of STR. Now I will run through the procedure. It all starts with a sample of DNA. Uh, you add fluorescent dye and amplify the DNA using multiplex PCR with primers to the various loci. We then perform capillary electrophoresis using a side st size standard run in parallel with an allylic ladder that corresponds to validated alleles. The result? is an electropharogram like so. We then perform the data analysis and compare the result to either a database or to a reference profile. The general requirements for the assay for running are a gene sequencer, a thermocycler, primers to the various loci, an STR database of cell lines, and most important of all really, uh, skilled technicians. It cannot be understated how important it is that you have someone who is adept at reading electropharograms analyzing your data. So I've explained the characteristics of STR. I've shown you how the assay is run. Now I'm going to show you how STR is analyzed. I'm going to start by showing you just one locus, D16S539 or D16 and this is on uh, uh, from a human sample. So D16 is characterized by the repeat motif GATA, as we see here. As you know, you inherit one set of chromosomes from your mother, one from your father, here and here. You can see here that the mother donated a chromosome with eight repeats at this locus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As did the father. Again, one, two, three, et cetera, through eight. Uh, when we run this, the peaks co-migrate. So you get a single peak at eight here. Now on the right-hand panel, we have a human individual who is heterozygous at D16. So we count 10 repeat units or alleles from the maternal, one through 10 here, and nine from the paternal chromosome. We see that two peaks run with the allele ladder, indicating the alleles at this locus are nine and 10. Some other examples uh, below, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tom has two peaks here, migrating with the nine and 10 allele ladder, 
So he's heterozygous at D16 for 9, 13. Dick has one peak at 10, indicating that co-migrated, so he's homozygous at D16 for 10. And then Harry here is heterozygous for 9 and 12. So that's just one locus. For the complete STR, you look at the allele numbers at all of the loci. Here's an example of how STR can differentiate between human cell lines. Here we're comparing K562, a chronic myelogenous leukemia cell line, with WS1, which is a fibroblastic cell line. Both of these are human. For K562, we see two peaks at 11 and 12 at locus D5. We see one peak at locus D13. Two peaks, one at 9, one at 11, at locus D7. At locus D16, we see peaks at 11 and 12. And then if we look all the way over here at amylogenin, we see a single peak. For WS1, at locus D5, we see a single peak at 13. Locus D13, we see a single peak at 12. We see two peaks, one at 9, one at 10, at D7. And if we jump all the way over to uh, melogenin, we see a single peak. So if we look at all the loci and the melogenin, we see different allele numbers for all but TPOX. Uh, we see that in melogenin, we have one peak, so it's female for sure. And what we're seeing is both female, uh, two unrelated cell lines, separate individual cell lines, unique STR profiles. In this slide, I'm showing how the mouse STR profiling service differentiates between two unrelated mouse cell lines. For brevity, I'm comparing the calls from four loci rather than running through all 18. So we're looking at 8-13, 4-2, 6-7, 9-12, at two different mouse cell lines. One is a fibroblastic cell lines, A9. The other, TM3, is a Leydig cell line that comes from a mouse testis. And uh, we can see at uh, lo locus uh, 813, a uh, band at 16. At locus 42, bands at 20.3 and 21.3. Uh, locus 67, band at 12 and a uh, peak at 12 for locus 19-2. Right. For TM3, we see all different peaks. So at 18-3, uh, we see a peak at 18. For 4-2, we see a peak at 19.3. For 6-7, we see a peak at 15. And at 19-2, we see a peak at 9. So again, two unrelated cell lines, two separate individuals, unique STR profiles. In this slide, I'm showing you what cellular contamination might look like in your STR profile. The upper electropherogram is human ovarian cell line SKOV3 here. The lower is SKOV3 cells contaminated with another cell line. We don't know which, um, but we do know that's human. So generally speaking, samples with more than three peaks at more than three loci may be due to cellular contamination. So you can see extra peaks here, 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 and here. These are definitely not artifacts. So many of these additional peaks meet the general consensus threshold of being greater than 20% of the allele size, like uh, in D13 here, for example. Uh, in D7 here, and in um, D16 here, and, and especially in, in VWA here, we see that as well. Uh, also, the peaks are much further out uh, than what you would see in stutter, which um, stutter happens when the polymerase loses its place when copying a strand of DNA, usually slipping forwards or backwards by four base pairs. So what you expect to see in the starter peaks typically hug the correct peak. So I've shown you what cellular cross-contamination looks like.
So I've just talked about SGR profiling, mostly in the context of human cell lines, but this also extends to mouse SGR profiling. I'm about to turn the presentation over to Balsam, who will present ATCC's new mouse STR service. By the way, if you're interested in ordering either of these services or ATCC's mycoplasma detection service, you can navigate to one of these URLs. For human STR, go to www.atcc.org slash human STR. For mycoplasma detection, go to www.atcc.org slash mycotesting. And for mouse STR profiling, go to www.atcc.org slash mouse STR. All right, over to you, Balsam. Thanks, Brian. Now let's take a look at ATCC's newest cell line authentication service, mouse STR profiling. In October 2016, NIST published a Federal Register notice inviting eligible laboratories to be part of the Mouse Cell Line Authentication Consortium. The goal of the consortium was to validate the STR assay to distinguish between mouse cell lines. Twelve laboratories, including ATCC and NIST, were part of the consortium study. ATCC provided the DNA that was distributed to the group alongside reagents, controls, and protocols provided by NIST. Each laboratory independently profiled and analyzed cell line data for each of the 50 blinded cell lines. Results were then sent into NIST, and a summary of the consortium's work was published in June of this year, shown here on the right. So let's take a look at the assay. The assay follows the same general STR protocol as described by my colleague Brian earlier in the webinar. The primers are designed to target the mus musculus species of mouse, and there are 18 mouse-specific loci and two human loci for contamination detection. The human primers are specific for human or African green monkey species and will bind to one or both species if they are detected within the submitted sample. Unlike most human STR kits, this assay does not include a gender identification marker. This MOS STR assay builds on the nine marker assay published by NIST back in 2014. The additional markers added to the nine flex allow for a higher power of discrimination and individualization of closely related mouse cell lines. In the photo on the right, you can see part of a full mouse STR profile with peaks present within the human STR markers. I will now go over some of the main takeaways from the consortium group's data. Most importantly, unique profiles were obtained for each of the cell lines tested, and closely related cell lines were distinguishable from each other. Out of the 50 samples tested, 42 were validated and published to NCBI's online biosample database. These cell lines had greater than a 98% concordance between the labs meaning that 98% or more of the allele calls were identical between all 12 labs. As you can see in the screenshot on the right, the biosample database contains the ATCC cell line information, allele calls, and the full mouse STR profile can, be, can also be accessed at the bottom of the page. Another takeaway from the consortium was the removal of locus 11-1. This locus exhibited abnormal peak morphologies which made interpretation difficult and minimizing the concordance between the labs. An example of this is shown here on the bottom left. Due to this, it was decided that the locus would be better suited for NGS technology and not for this STR assay. So the great news is, is that ATCC has licensed the validated assay from NIST and the mouse cell line authentication service is available for order online now. With this service, our customers can conveniently spot and ship samples on Wattman FDA cards. FDA cards lyse the cells on contact and bind DNA tightly to the card for long-term preservation. The cards are easy to ship at room temperature without the need for ice or liquid nitrogen. Profiles will be generated following the NIST protocol and compared to ATCC's mouse STR database with results emailed within three to five business days. Data interpretation guidelines will follow NIST's patent in the consortium publication. Comparison of the submitted sample profile with ATCC's database 
will follow the Tanabe matching algorithm. This algorithm will give a percent match comparing the number of alleles in the submitted sample and the database sample, including how many of those alleles, alleles match. Now let's take a look at the service steps. The first step is to place an online order for the mouse STR service. The webpage can be accessed directly at www.atcc.org slash mouse STR. The webpage also includes additional information on the assay and a sample of the submission form and final report. After placing your online order, an FTA card will be shipped to you with accompanying spotting instructions. The instructions are detailed and explain exactly how to resuspend and spot your cells or extracted DNA. Once the sample is at the optimal spotting density or concentration, it is very important to mix thoroughly prior to spotting on the card. Subsequently, the cards are left to dry at room temperature and then placed in the provided multi-barrier pouch for shipping back to ATCC. The other side of the sample submission form contains the submission information, such as your name, email address, and cell line designation. It is important here that the email address is written or typed clearly, as this will be the email used to send out the final mouse STR report. At the top right of the submission form is the unique barcode associated with the sample. This barcode is how we track the sample throughout the service process. The barcode will be located on the FTA card, the submission form, and on the supplied shipping envelope. Once the, once the spotted FTA card is received here at ATCC, an acknowledgement email will be sent out to confirm sample receipt. Our biologist will then begin processing the submitted sample and generating the mouse STR profile. Here on the left is a sample profile matching one of our ATCC cell lines, TIB71. Once the sample profile is generated and the data is analyzed, the allele calls will then be run through our mouse STR database. At this step, our database will identify any matches to an ATCC cell line using the Tanabe matching algorithm. Let's take a look at the final report generated for this sample, which matched 100% to the raw macrophage cell line TIB71. Seen here on the left is the first page of the report. If we zoom into the table, you can see the submitted, submitted or query sample alleles on the left-hand column and the matching database alleles on the right-hand column. The first row on the bottom of the table show the, num the total number of matching alleles and the second and third rows show the total number of alleles in the query and database cell line. The last row shows the percent match between them, which is 100% for this sample. On the bottom half of the first page, one of the four final result boxes will be checked. The first checkbox will correspond to a submitted sample that is an exact or 100% match to an ATCC cell line, which is what we have in this instance. The second checkbox will correspond to a full mouse profile being generated, but one that does not match one of ATCC cell lines. The third checkbox will correspond to a sample profile that is similar or greater than an 80% match to an ATCC cell line. Lastly, the fourth checkbox corresponds to an STR profile that could not be generated from one of the submitted FTA cards. This does, this does happen, and we sometimes see this when the cell suspension or DNA was not mixed properly prior to spotting. This result can also be checked if a non-murine cell line was mistakenly spotted on the card. Lastly, here on the bottom, there is a checkbox to identify if human or African green monkey species was detected within the sample. The last page of the report is the comparative output. This is a useful table where you can take a look at the allele calls side by side for the submitted and matched sample. This table will also expand to include any other cell lines that may be a similar match. 
In this case, we have an exact match, so there are no additional cell lines added to the table. Attached to the emailed report we just reviewed will also be a PDF file of the submitted sample profile. To review, ATCC has worked with NIST to pioneer the first validated mouse STR profiling assay. ATCC's mouse cell line authentication service is inexpensive and fast, similar to our human STR service. Samples are spotted on FTA cards, which makes for easy sample handling and shipping, with results emailed within three to five business days. The final mouse STR reports will include allele calls for the submitted and matching cell lines across all 18 loci, as well as a contamination check to detect for human or African green monkey species. The comparative output will also allow you to review any additional cell lines that may be similar to your sample and a PDF of the sample profile will also be provided. ATCC's newest service offering is one of a kind, as we are the first and only laboratory providing the new 20-plex mouse STR assay for authentication of mouse cell lines. Now that we have discussed our STR assays and ATCC's authentication services, let's switch gears and take a look at why cell line authentication is important and when to authenticate your cell lines. So why should you authenticate your cell lines? Most importantly, many journals are requiring and strongly encouraging cell line authentication. As you can see here on the chart, many high impact journals, including approximately 150 Nature and over 200 Biomed Central journals require or strongly encourage cell line authentication prior to a manuscript submission. In a 2017 IJC article, Fusenig and colleagues discuss the need for a worldwide consensus for cell line authentication and highlight that there is ample evidence that cross-contamination and misidentification exists. As also discussed by my colleague Brian, many other implications like the loss of time, and money, or even publication retraction are also very compelling reasons to ensure your cell lines are authenticated. Alongside the requirement for authentication from publishers also includes agency requirements, including the NIH and FDA. In 2016, the NIH revised its grant application guidelines to include their expectation that key biological and or chemical resources be regularly authenticated to ensure their identity. The FDA has also published their recommendations, which identify STR analysis to be used by manufacturers of viral vaccines for characterization of cell substrates and other biological materials. So we have covered the importance of cell line authentication and the requirements that have been set forth by major government agencies and publishers. I will now go over when to authenticate your cell lines. Firstly, it is important to obtain cell lines from a reputable source, a biorepository like ATCC, where our products go through extensive QC testing to ensure our cell lines are authenticated and free of contaminants. Once a cell line is received, it is recommended to authenticate at the beginning of a study as well as at the conclusion. It is also important to authenticate at key points within your work, like before a grant or manuscript submission or when a cell bank is prepared. Authentication should also be done within regular intervals of the study, say every five or 10 passages or so. And finally, when in doubt, authenticate your cells. There is no right or wrong time to authenticate, and it can be done at any time. Authenticating early and regularly will help identify any cross-contamination or misidentification early on. It is better to confirm you are using the cells that you expect than to find out later that your cells are cross-contaminated or misidentified. I will now hand the discussion back to my colleague, Brian, who will close out our presentation. Thanks, Balsam. So today we talked about how cell line misidentification and contamination bears a high cost in terms of money wasted, misinformation in the literature, and setting back medical science. Uh, we presented how STR profiling is a powerful means of identifying cell lines, uh, both mouse and human. We talked about how ATCC has collaborated with NIST and independent researchers to generate consensus standards around its use for cell line authentication. 
We also talk about how the STR uh, services are simple to use, simply place your order, spot your cells on the provided Wattman FTA card, and send it back to us. You'll receive your report in three to five days. Then we stress how important cell authentication is now with journals and funding agencies requiring proof of, proof of authentication to publish, be awarded grants, and for uh, new drug uh, submissions. Finally, we gave you guidelines on when to authenticate your cell lines. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll take your questions now. Thank you, Brian. In just a few moments, we'll begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat, fu chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. The recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. Thank you. Okay, this first question looks like a good one for Balsam. What does a match against the ATCC mouse STR profile database mean? Thanks, Alan. So matching against the mouse STR profile database means that we'll compare the allele calls generated from the submitted sample to our cell line database. So the computer software will scan the database to find any cell lines that match 80% or greater to your sample profile. To develop this database, ATCC has profiled our cell lines using the new mouse STR assay to establish their baseline or the reference profile. The profile database will continue to grow as STR profiles are updated and new profiles are also added. And also to answer another question that just came in, this database is not public. All right, thank you, Balsam. Um, this next one looks like a good one for Brian. Uh, why is it that human SDR profiling only uses eight loci for cell authentication, but you need 18 for the mouse? All right, so that is a good one. So I'd say that this comes down to the fact that you end up with more homozygosity with mouse cell lines. So think of it this way. Most of the mouse cell lines used in research come from inbred colonies, and there's a limited number of mouse strains. So while there will be some genetic drift, you're likely to see a lot of repetition of allele calls in, in many of the alleles since they come from the same parental mice, really. Uh, if they're from the same strain, that is. So you don't see that so much with human STR profiling because humans generally don't come from inbred populations. All right, thank you. Uh, here's another one for Brian. Uh, I noticed that some of the allele calls were not whole numbers. Why is that? All right, so nice. I was hoping someone was gonna ask this question. Uh, so what you're seeing is a consequence of microvariants. So sometimes microvariants are seen where a mutation arises to offset the perfect repeating unit. A good example of this is TH01. So TH01's repeat is TCAT or TCAT. If that last T is mutated to something else, um, so it's really the most common microvariant in humans uh, at the TH01 allele is 9.3. This mutation is going to have nine repeats plus three additional base pairs. And, and by the way, there cannot be a 9.4 because really with repeats of four base pairs, a 9.4 equals a 10. All right. I see. Okay, Balsam. Uh, you made the point a couple of times in the webinar on the importance of mixing the sample uh, whether it's cells or DNA before spotting them on the FTA paper. Uh, why is that? Uh, that's a good point. So it is very important to mix the cell suspension or DNA uh, prior to spotting on the card. And most importantly with the cell suspensions, if you are not mixing just prior to spotting, the cells may fall out of the suspension and accumulate at the bottom of the tube. So this really de decreases the chance that the cells will be picked up when pipetting onto the card. So when our biologists then go to analyze these samples, they may not get a profile or just a partial profile So there, since there wasn't enough DNA or cells on the card. So it's kind of like just when you're counting cells in general, right? You want to mix them up really oh, yeah. good first. Yes, yes. Okay, cool, cool. All right, I'm going to um, give the next one to Brian as well. Uh, what happens when you run STRs from the same donor, would you expect to see the same profile or could you differentiate between cell lines from the same mouse or human? 
Okay, so that, that's a good question. Um, and there, there's actually an example of this that I've used in previous talks. So um, the HAAE2 aortic cell line and the HFAE2 femoral artery cell line. So they're both cells from the same human donor. Uh, both are endothelial cell types. The STR profile for these is identical at all loci. So the short answer for that is yes, you'd expect to see the same profile. Now, uh, if you're looking at a cell line from a, the original cell bank versus a culture that's been passaged like 50 times, you'd start to see something different, right, because of genetic drift. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there, there's another caveat to this, like there is in everything. Um, in, in the course of cell culture, the cells may simply become aneuploid by gaining like a, a partial set of chromosomes and the complete chromosomes duplicated. And, and uh, in that case, you would see, you could see different growth characteristics in the cell line, but you'd see the same STR profile. And like, say, if you did a karyotype or something like that, you'd pick up on the extra chromosomes being the problem. Um, and, you know, this is indeed the case if you see like maybe a clonal derivative from a parental cell line. But generally speaking, though, um, STR will do a good job of differentiating cell cultures from different donors or um, cultures that are contaminated with different cells. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> I'm going to send the next one to Balsam. Uh, here's a question around confidentiality. Does ATCC share my STR profiling results with anyone else? No, absolutely not. We do not share any results, and they're not sent, and the results are actually only sent to the email address provided on the sample submission form. So the data produced is strictly confidential, and it's not used for any comparison to any samples from any of our customers. So when a sample is submitted for testing, we only compare it to our ATCC reference profiles that were generated in-house. Okay. Um, next one is for Brian. Uh, I've been working with a prostate tumor recently, and we found out that it lacked the Y variant of the amyloid gene and marker. Um, how do you reconcile this? <laughs> I apologize for the pronunciation. No, no, I think you got it, actually. Um, <laughs> So great question. It's true, many tumor cells that come from male donors lose the Y chromosome. Uh, this seems to be especially rampant in prostate carcinoma cell lines, which are by definition a male cell, right? Uh, so loss of the Y chromosome has been reported since the 70s. Uh, it's actually been uh, hypothesized to be a normal part of uh, aging, but it's also seen in a lot of, seen in a lot of tumor types. Now, if I recall correctly, it's also observed in colorectal, pancreatic cancer, and most often, I think, in blood cancers. It's actually been proposed as a contributor to cancer in men. So, um, and, and just as a little bit of follow-up, um, typically, it's the small chromosomes that are lost more readily than large chromosomes in tumor cells. So, you know, the Y chromosome is, what it's the smallest chromosome, isn't it? So... Makes sense that it would be lost. Then, then Brian, as a follow-up, then how many how many cell lines in ATCC are male and lost in uh, uh, and lost the Y chromosome? So that's good. I know I saw that it came in. They spelled Y Y <laughs> question mark. Um, there are over a hundred reportedly male cell lines uh, in our collection that appear to have lost the Y chromosome. And they'll basically all, they'll only yield an X chromosome result for a millogenin. Um, and it really, it turns out that only three of these were isolated from normal tissues. The rest of them are from tumor cells. But remember, you can still differentiate them from other cells by the other eight markers, right? So a millogenin is just really one marker and we don't even look for that with the mouse STR. Okay, great. Um, another one that just came in. Um, I noticed that in some of the STR profiles you showed there were other smaller peaks hugging the main peak. Why is this and what is the cause of this? Right, and um, yeah, someone was <clears throat> asking that about um, the mouse loci as well too. So that's a, that's a good catch. Um, that's correct. What you're seeing is repeat slippage um, or stutter. 
So stutters, uh, a single repeat unit smaller than the true peak, uh, which occurs immediately before or after the true peak. Uh, these peaks um, may result in differences between two samples of a cell line at one locus and typically less than 15% of the true peak. Uh, the stutter is actually caused by errors in DNA poly polymerase mediated amplification. Great. Okay, um, this one will be for Balsam. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently acquired a novel cell line from a collab collaborator. Uh, this is a unique cell line that cannot be purchased from a cell bank or reputable source. Uh, when should I test them? So, well, you should follow the general testing protocol that I did outline in the, in the slides. Um, and you can definitely use our STR service. I mean, even if it isn't an ATCC cell line, uh, you can still use our human or mouse STR services. You know, although a match won't be made to one of our cell lines, uh, you can still confirm that the cell line is the expected species, as well as identify any contamination. I mean, the, the key to testing when it's a non-ATC cell line is to authenticate as soon as possible and before you begin using the cell line in your study. Uh, the profile generated early on will essentially establish the cell line's baseline profile. So this baseline or, or the reference will be the profile for your starting material. So as you go through your research and authenticate at the key points that I had discussed, uh, this will allow you to check that the cell line matches your starting material uh, throughout your study um, and therefore identify any contamination or mis misidentification. Great answer. Okay, this one's for uh, Brian. Um, I understand that STR profiling is only available for human and mouse cell lines. Do you have anything for cell line authentication for other animals? As a, and as a follow-up, uh, are there other methods to authenticate cell lines besides short tandem repeat profiling? All right, so um, you can use cytochrome 1 oxidase or CO1 assay for interspecies identity. Uh, CO1 gene region that's used um, as a standard barcode for almost all animal groups, uh, that's like a 650 base pair region um, in the five prime region of mitochondrial uh, CO1 gene. And um, that can be used to discriminate between species of the same genus. And we actually have a, a webinar on this that was broadcast uh, back in 2016. So if you want to learn more about it, um, Yvonne Reed and Jason Cooper delivered that, that talk. And um, it's at www.atcc.org slash webinars. And just click on 2016, and it'll be in that list. Uh, it's, it's one of the first of that year, um, from that year, so it might be on the second page. Um, now, in addition to STR profiling and CO1 barcoding, there's other ways to resolve the identity and status of a cell line. So you could do growth curve analysis, um, there's karyotyping, right? Um, random amplified polymorphic DNA, uh, and also SNP analysis. Um, Brian, but uh, we don't do SNP or the, the uh, RAPD analysis, right? So, and as far as I know, uh, karyotyping, we don't, uh, it's a thing of the past, it's, uh, it's not the newest technology anymore. That, that is true, that's true. Um, but a growth curve is definitely something that you can and you should do in your lab. So if you notice your cells aren't growing like they should, that's a pretty red flag to get your cells authenticated or, or start with a new batch, right? Um, you know, check your cells before you wreck yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, and don't forget also, we've got uh, mycoplasma detection assays too, and that, and that could be affecting your growth curve. So we have three options around that. Okay. All right. Um, everyone, is there a recommended maximum passage uh, number for a cell line before it's no longer useful? Okay. So not directly related to STR, but, but a good culture question nonetheless. Um, so that, that sort of thing should be determined empirically really for, for each cell line, right? Um, so, you know, they say immortalized cell lines have an indefinite life expectancy, but, but we all know that the characteristics and properties change markedly when you've been cultivating them for a long time, you know? Um, 
you know, it's it's really best to adopt the the C stock principle, right? Where you have a you have a master cell bank and then you set up a working cell bank from that and you and you take aliquots from that. So you know, it's best to then keep returning back to low passage stocks. And that's that's what ATCC does basically. Uh, now, generally speaking, uh, we recommend passaging a culture no more than eight to ten times or um, two months. Yeah. Great. Oh, oh wait a minute. So we've got a, another question here, and it says, in humans, three peaks and three loci are indicative of contamination. Does the same standard hold true for the mouse loci? All right, so I can answer that one. Um, not, not necessarily. Three peaks for three loci when you're doing maybe forensic analysis and you're um, STR profiling individuals does mean contamination for sure. But when you're doing cell culture, uh, some cell lines do exhibit MSI, uh, which is microsatellite instability. So you can get more than one loci um, in a human cell culture. And this is actually quite common, especially in tumor cancer cell lines. And this is seen in mouse STR as well. All right. Um, well, if there, if there aren't any more questions, uh, at this time, we'll conclude our Q&A session. I'd like to thank our panelists for the excellent presentation and thank everyone for attending this webinar. Please join us for more webinars in the ATCC Excellence in Research series. On September 26th, ATCC product line business specialist Kyle Young will present uh, his talk on molecular standards. Thank you and have a great day.